Okay, uh, so we are ready for the second talk of the morning session. And this will be from Yu Boom Jo from HKUST, which is Remarkam, I was told. And uh, his topic is observing non emission phenomena in ultra cold permeans. So please. So good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers for uh, putting this together. So I really enjoy all these uh, fantastic talks. Uh, I'm Kyu Bloom from uh, HKUSD in Hong Kong. And today I'd like to talk about our experimental works on uh, so-called the non-emission phenomena in the ultra cold permit. Um, I'm really uh, lucky to have the previous speaker who actually introduced all these cold atomic technologies. So I, I love to uh, thanks to him. Um, but I'd like to thank the, our, our team first. Uh, we have uh, several operators in Hong Kong, uh, but most of the work I'm presenting today is from the uh, Etorium team. So uh, they have a fantastic work. So I'd like to love, uh, I'd love to uh, introduce myself uh, our works. But actually, I'm actually moving to Rice next year. So I'm not sure how many Experimental students are here, but if you happen to be interested in my group, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, we are working with a atomic uh, quantum simulator, as we call it these days. Uh, essentially, we use the laser lines and the uh, atom, of course, uh, in, the, in the middle of the vacuum chambers. So this is the snapshot of our lab. And as you see, it looks like the optics lab, but we put the atoms into the vacuum chamber and, and make the synthetic quantum system as we wish. And the problem we actually do pro to study the, uh, the Hamiltonian we would like to study, uh, we need a quantum resource, but obviously uh, we use the atoms, uh, but our community has put a lot of efforts to cool down the atoms all the way down to the uh, even nano Kelvin. So this is very standard technique these days. So we actually employ uh, similar methods. And our starting point is the ultra cold atoms, either bosons and fermions around the tens of nanokelvin. And with this sample, we are ready to uh, roll out experiments. So what do we do? Essentially, we do the quantum simulation by engineering the Hamiltonians. We obviously have the quantum objects and we can actually program and more specifically in our experiments, we do the Hamiltonian engine. So essentially, we have nothing in the vacuum as the previous speaker uh, described. We actually create the Hamiltonians, and whenever we create something, we can control everything on the means. That's uh, our uh, goal. Especially uh, in our cold atom experiments, in the context of the quantum simulation uh, in optical lattice, for instance, we actually have the uh, atoms hopping around this uh, synthetic potential which is quite similar to the, uh, the solid state crystal, uh, except for the time scale or energy scale we control. Uh, essentially, we are looking at this uh, atoms hopping around, which is kind of similar to the electrons in the solids. Uh, most of the Hamiltonian we study is exactly the same as the Hamiltonian transmitter, except for the uh, time scale, which is why we actually can study the non-equilibrium dynamics uh, as we wish. So the typical time scale is around the microsecond to the milliseconds, much slower than the ultra fast regime in the previous talk. But essentially, we can monitor the dynamics, hopefully with the single atom resolution as well. Uh, so essentially, what we do is we just prepare the uh, quantum states as we wish and let it go. And after some time, we uh, monitor either the spin distribution or density distribution. Uh, in our system. However, we have a two different approach in, in, in the cold atom community at this point. And one of them is a top-down approach. Essentially, you make uh, some trap, including a lot of atoms, some sample of atoms, typically tens of maybe sometimes millions of atoms into the Hamiltonian you want to study. And of course, you have a bunch of atoms, which means you only know the density distribution without the single atom resolutions. Another approach is to use, to use the optical tweezer technique demonstrated in the previous the beautiful talks. So you can trap the atoms, single atoms, one by one and make a synthetic crystal. So both approaches are very complementary. And we also use a both, both uh, approaches, but I'm going to talk about the results from the, uh, the top-down approach uh, for these talks. 
So what do we do in, in my group uh, in Hong Kong? We actually run the two, three different experiments and we have uh, uh, various projects going on. Uh, but at this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, two things. The first is the topological matter, such as the topological insulator for the cold atoms uh, in both the Hermitian and non Hermitian regime. So to address this question, we actually couple our quantum systems, the environments, and the so-called open quantum system can be realized on demands. Uh, on the other hand, we have a other project we are going to uh, study or we are doing at this point. One example is the SUN symmetric Fermi gas, uh, Fermi gases, which is uh, somewhat connected to the uh, high energy people in the context of the QCD or color superfluids. Another project is also the tweezer experiments going on. So if you'd like to know more about our efforts, uh, I'm happy to discuss after the talk. And so towards the end of the talk, I'm going to introduce uh, a few slides about these exciting directions with the uh, dipolar uh, two-dimensional superfluids in which we actually can study some non-equilibrium dynamics, uh, hopefully uh, with the very strong dipolar emissions. So I'll just come back to these points. But in this talk, uh, we actually study open quantum system by introducing the dissipation. But this is actually the, the motivation we had a couple of years back. So essentially in our system, we would like to know how these interactions change the many body system or topological system. And obviously in our community, you can introduce these uh, contact interactions or two body interactions. Uh, and uh, some, some colleagues in ETH or Italy, they actually study the robustness of topological states by by exploring this uh, the topological pumping or whole effects in the presence of interactions. So our motivation was slightly different because of course you can turn on the contact interactions, but the other uh, way we do is you can introduce this uh, two-body like, two uh, dissipation or two-body atom loss into the system or one-body atom loss. Actually, this approach has been inspired by the uh, uh, very seminal work by the <laughs> previous speaker and also together with uh, Yoshiro in, in Kyoto. And actually they studied these uh, body flow experiments uh, with a two body uh, atom loss um, uh, is part in this paper. So coming back to our approach, so we essentially study how this uh, atom loss or dissipation affects such as the topological matter made of the atom. So this is our big question. Uh, essentially, we do have a component system, but I would like to mention for the specialist, there are two kind of complementary pictures. So in our case, we actually have a loss in our system, which means we only look at the remaining atoms out of the system. In other words, we do some post selection, uh, and it's obviously non-equilibrium dynamics because we keep losing the particle out of my experiments. And essentially, we have is, I mean, we effectively make the effective Hamiltonian, which is non emission, and look at the uh, phenomena we are expected to see. Well, of course, there are different versions with the quantum jumps in the experiments, and without this so called semi classical approximation or without the post selection, you can actually look at all, all this quantum trajectory with the quantum jumps. Sometimes, this is the more quantum version of these open quantum systems. And some experiments, such as the superconducting qubits, they can also look at this uh, Lewillian uh, dynamics without these cross selections. And I have to say that our cold atom community or our lab, we can also do this, uh, uh, but I'm going to present the results in, in this domain, in this talk. So if you would like to know more about this, Lewillian approach, I will explain after the talk. All right, so let's uh, dive into our experiments. So what should we do? Uh, essentially, there are two keywords we'd like to introduce uh, into this experiment. One is the topological uh, band structure. The other one is the dissipation. So to make the atom uh, behave topological, we have to think about how we introduce the uh, gauge field. Because the atom, the neutral atom we work, is essentially uh, uh, charged neutral. And it doesn't see any uh, physical magnetic or electric field. 
So what we do here is we actually engineer the effective factor potential in such a way that the atom feel the physical uh, magnetic fields. But of course, when I come back to this point is our community has been able to make the synthetic gauge fields, uh, but the real value to gauge fields. But in the dissipative system, you can also create the complex gauge potential, which is a uh, somewhat unusual in the control situation. So how do you make that? So in our community, uh, there are a couple of different approach, but one of the common approach is to use the optical coupling, which is what we uh, do in our experiments. So essentially you have, uh, you prepare the spin up and spin down atoms, either in the bulk or of the lattice or the deep tweezer, and you just shine the uh, two, a pair of Raman lights, and you couple the spin degree of freedom with these uh, Raman traditions. So this optic optical coupling method has been very popular in the community. And we already know that how to make uh, the synthetic gauge field or the spin OB coupling uh, for your uh, atoms. So in our group, we actually employ this method, even in the lab case, not in the bulk. Uh, for instance, you can make the uh, one dimensional version of the topological insulator or specialized is a symmetry protected topological uh, phase in 1D. And you can generalize this approach to the 3D then you can create so-called so the nodal line semi-metal band structure when you travel from this. But all this work has been have been done in the Hermitian region, which means the system is very well isolated without the dissipation as much as possible. And the next question is how do we introduce the dissipation into the system? Well, as probably everybody believes, the cold atom system is very much isolated from the environment, which is true. Uh, unless you do something wrong. So what we do here is we intentionally couple your spin up and spin down system, which stays in the ground level of our uh, internal structure. We intentionally shine the laser light, which is near resonant to the uh, some optical transitions. Then what happens is this blue and red atoms, they just keep uh, escaping from uh, the manifold we are interested in. And thanks to the, uh, the internal structures, when you shine this laser light, you have a spin sensitive uh, atom loss. And the blue atoms, they just go on quickly. The red atoms is relatively slow. So essentially, we introduce the spin sensitive uh, atom loss or dissipation into the system. And all this ratio or the, this uh, dissipation, it's under control. So we can choose uh, as we wish. And of course, uh, if you do this dissipation uh, in a random way, we essentially destroy the quantities or the coherence of the system. So we have to do it in an organized way. And if you look at this system, I have a red and blue spins moving left or towards the right because of the spin will be coupling. And I introduced the dissipation for the red and blue atoms. Uh, but the way we introduce dissipation is as follows. Because because of this spin sensitive dissipation, as long as you offset the the average dissipation between this red and blue, you can effect, effectively approximate this system as the gain and loss of the system. And if you write down these two levels of two level Hamiltonian with the off diagonal terms, the coupling you know, of spin up and spin down with some energy difference you effectively have I gamma and minus I gamma because you have effective gain and loss in the interior system. And then if your energy eigenvalue becomes complex for the large gamma or real value for the small gamma. So this is how we actually explore so-called uh, non-hermitian physics across this parity time symmetry breaking, which has been uh, uh, around quite a while in, in, in this community. And this uh, non remission system uh, with this gain and loss or parity time symmetry uh, breaking, indeed uh, very ubiquitous, is essentially uh, everywhere, ranging from this acoustic or photonic crystal, the cavity system to even the biological system. Uh, but very quickly, the, the people in the quantum uh, domain, we start to explore this non remission or open quantum system to engineer the quantum states uh, as you wish. So the people actually in the MP centers, super qubits, or 
quantum optics setup, these non-emission quantum phenomena have been very actively explored and realized uh, in these domains. In a closed atom setting, uh, we do the same uh, thing, uh, but there is a slight difference because most of the quantum uh, platform at, at this point is essentially a, a single single object for this uh, work. But essentially, in cold atom, we have many particles. But it doesn't mean that we actually study many body non emission physics, which is quite uh, uh, challenging. We still work in the single body uh, physics with the non empty but still we we have a hope or potential to uh, generalize this uh, this picture to the uh, many body. Uh, All right, so let's get into the experiments. So again, uh, we this is a very simplified level structure for the spin up and spin down atoms, coupled to the Raman transitions. In the real experiments, you, we actually are able to look at the spin information together with the momentum, so you can fully resolve uh, what's going on in the experiments. And the uh, band structure uh, we typically have in the bulk system is as follows. So you have a uh, two dress band structure with a spin up and spin down degrees of freedom. And with this optical coupling technique in the ball without the optical lattice, just for now, if you write down the Hamiltonian, it's very much simple or same as the, uh, the two level system. So if you look at the off diagonal terms, you have a coupling strength around about this. Uh, 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 and if you look at the diagonal terms, you have energy shift, but you do have this uh, dispersions just because of this spin of coupling. So this uh, quadratic terms is just uh, reminiscence of this spin of coupling. Other than that, this is simply two by two matrix or two level system, but uh, it depends on the momentum because of this positive momentum because of the uh, spin of coupling. So now what you do is you introduce the spin sensitive loss. So you have a very strong loss for the blue atoms, maybe a little bit modest loss for the red atoms. And again, you have a the ratio of the one to 13, but if you sub, uh, subtract maybe the average value, maybe six, you effectively have a gain and loss. So for the specialist uh, in this non emission uh, phenomena, this is kind of the passive uh, time reversal, sorry, passive parity time uh, symmetry, not active. So as long as you know the system is dissipative overall, then you still have this uh, parity time symmetry with the overall yeah. So by the loss and gain, do you mean the single body loss and gain here? Uh, for this experiment, yes, we have, we are considering one body loss. And yeah, I have another question. So uh, I wonder uh, how you can get rid of the interactions here. Does it always exist? Um, yeah, that's great question. So for our experiments, uh, it's weakly interacting, almost non-interacting limits. Uh, we love to see the interaction effects, uh, but the challenge for our experiment is not that tunable. Mm -hmm. So one way we can go beyond this experiment is if you introduce the two-body loss. Uh, then this dissipation will be density sensitive, for instance. And that then probably you have to imagine this many body uh, dynamics. However, here, even though we have a one body loss, uh, we have a Fermi C because we're using uh, uh, Fermi's. Huh. And whenever you remove the particle, there is a hole left. So these whole dynamics should play with this uh, dissipation process, which is uh, beyond what we can manage at this point. But all the experiments we are, I'm presenting today is based on the single part. Thank you. And just feel free to ask me the question. Uh, all right, so uh, now we do have this uh, loss and the strong loss and, and the weak loss in the like terms. And let's see what happens. Without the loss here, we plot this uh, dispersion relations or band structure without the lattice at this point. It's a bulk physics. So we have a momentum axis, the horizontal axis. In the vertical axis, we plot the energy. So this is a very typical spin of coupled bands, uh, even in the lattice or bulk. 
So this is the uh, band structure we have without the loss or when we turn off the dissipation. When you switch on the dissipation, so the band structure change gradually, but one of the feature you recognize here is the band gap becomes smaller. And if you go further, at certain point, this band gap just closed. And if you go very strong dissipation, it looks like it appears these two bands does not see with, with each other. This is completely uh, physical because the dissipation essentially compete with the spin of a coupling. If you have a very strong dissipation, uh, it's more like the reminiscence of these quantum zeno effects because whenever the particle uh, trying to flip the spin, it can't because of this very strong measurement or dissipation. So that's why it looks like the two bands does not see each other. It looks like we switch off the spin of the coupling. And there is, of course, very special points when these two bands just close, and we call it the exceptional points, which is the uh, very different from this uh, regular, I mean, normal situation, because at this exceptional point, we know that uh, either both eigenvalue and eigenvector, they are all uh, coalesces and, and, and degenerates, and the system got somewhat frustrated at this exceptional point. So Sorry, what well, is the difference between this circle figure and the rightmost figure? It, they look almost the same uh, to me. Um, actually, there, there, there's a slight difference because at this exceptional point, only one point uh, meet. I mean, and there's some singular, singular tunnel. So yeah. what happens in the rightmost? Oh, well, this one, still the gap is closed, but this, uh, this shape becomes a perfect problem. Oh. For, for instance, yeah. It's so hard to see, right? Yeah, it's hard to see. Perfect. Yeah. But if you just look at the band gap at, at certain uh, momenta, then you clearly see the band gap is closed and it stays zero. Okay. Let me just make sure. So you were just putting the uh, real on the eigen bodies, right? But uh, in principle, you have imaginary part. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. So here I only plot the real part of the energy, uh, but we can measure both real and energy. So this is just band gap that we, everybody knows. So this is the only part of the story because in, in the experiment, we can measure uh, both the imaginary and the, the, the real parts. So here, we just park the experiments at this singular point. So I like to see how this band gap closed. So I just choose the one particular QX and directly measure the band gap. So the way we measure is we can quench the system and do the spectroscopy, and you can extract either band gap, which is the real part of the eigenvalue, or the imaginary part of the, part of the uh, imaginary the band gap, which is corresponding to the depth. So in the horizontal axis, we increase the dissipation, which means in this plot, uh, I increase the dissipation and measure the band gap. And as we wish, uh, the band gap just closed at the exceptional points and stay zero. The corresponding damping rates or imaginary parts stays very small, but around the exceptional point, it monotonically increased. So these two regime characterized by this uh, measurements uh, before the exceptional point, this parity time symmetry is conserved, which means spin up and spin down, there is no preferential uh, states. But after this exceptional point, this PT symmetry is just broken. So the system monotonically goes one way, not the other. So you just choose either spin up or spin down and it monotonically uh, dance. Uh, this is a one way we identify the PT symmetry or uh, PT symmetry breaking transitions and the exceptional points. And this experiment, we actually can do something more as an application. For instance, it was actually well known from uh, different aspects that if you actually prepare the quantum states somewhere very far from the exceptional points in the parameter space, and if it encircle nearby the exceptional points, it turns out that there is a chirality. So in this experiment, what we do is we prepare the blue atoms at the beginning, and then encircle our quantum states in the primary space, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And for this clockwise uh, encircling, because of this uh, full two pi encircling, 
the quantum state just stay at the blue. But surprisingly, if you do other way, uh, there is a chiral spin transport or uh, yeah, chiral spin transport as we directly measure in this uh, red plot. And this actually is a reminiscence of this uh, dissipative system. It's just because in this Riemann C sheet or energy plane, the system always try to choose the minimal the loss instead of uh, respecting this adiabatic uh, trajectories. So I'm a bit confused. Can you go back to the previous page? And, uh, so the Hamiltonian doesn't seem to have PT symmetry except for some special gamma up and gamma down. Uh, so no, no. actually, we have to define the pseudo pseudo uh, pseudo parity and pseudo time mm -hmm. in our case. But then, if you just gate that in, if offset in the middle, we can still have the uh, parity symmetry. You mean you have to see that that has no terms by constant? Yeah, <laughs> just like that. Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. But there's some another solution because we have a firm, so we have to use the suit of uh, PD symmetry. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Um, right, so yeah, we demonstrate this chiral behavior uh, at, in that experiment, but we actually can directly reveal what happens when we go uh, some trajectory. So this is kind of the primary space. Uh, with the horizontal axis of this QX, vertical axis is the dissipation we control. And this path from here to there, this is the one of the path when we encircle the system. And we know that something happens um, along this path. And in this experiment, we are preparing, we directly measure how this spin down atoms flip to the spin uh, up atoms. And uh, from our theoretical estimations, the reason of this non adiabatic transition increase when you increase the sweep rates. And we hope to actually identify uh, this kind of uh, expectation. And we measure that uh, this uh, sweep, uh, this non adiabatic regime really increase when we in, I mean, uh, sweep the system or states faster, which is quite uh, encouraging to directly visualize this. Uh, so, so far, I only demonstrate this uh, non hermitian spin of a coupling in the bulk system. So, now let's go to the uh, periodic lattice system. So, essentially, we apply the same uh, methods into the lattice system. So, essentially, we just turn on the optical lattice uh, potential on top of this spin of a coupling with the uh, dissipation. And the, the idea is still there. Uh, now, because of the lattice structure, we have to look at this exceptional points or singular points in the block space, not in the quasi-momentum uh, space. Other than that, everything should be same. However, we probably know that uh, a lot of the theorists in the Japanese community, uh, they explore how this band topology with symmetry and for other degrees of freedom interplay with this non uh, uh in, 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 in this uh, quantum system. So that's exactly what we'd like to explore. So to make it happen, we actually slightly modify our uh, optical lattice with this Raman coupling. Uh, in this way, essentially, the long story to short, we essentially have a two-dimensional uh, lattice structure with the uh, spin of a coupling. So let's see what happens. Uh, however, when you get into the, uh, the experiments, I want to point out one very interesting phenomenon, so-called the uh, skin effect. Because in the Hermitian lattice with the pre periodic uh, optical lattice or periodic potential, we all know that whenever you calculate the event structure or other information like topology, uh, you calculate this the extended block wave functions. And this is a very good wave function, even in the open boundary condition, because your system perturbatively stable uh, according to this approximate wave functions. However, when you turn on the dissipation or non hermeticity people actually immediately found some very interesting observation. For example, if you have an open boundary condition, just calculate the eigenstates of this system with non hermeticity you immediately found 
that the atoms, uh, sorry, the wave function should be or appears to be localized at nearby the one of the atoms or sometimes both. Uh, and the people call it like skin effects or non-emission skin effects uh, uh, recently. And it was a kind of, kind of puzzling because it looks like the block picture breaks down and a lot of people, uh, probably some of them in this audience, try to understand this uh, non-emission skin effects, which is the iconic phenomena we see in the non-emission uh, lighting system. And at least in the one-dimensional case, it has been quite well resolved by generalizing this block picture into the complex plane. But however, if you go to the higher, higher dimensions, for instance, 2D or 3D, well, this problem is still uh, unresolved, although we expect most likely that skin effects exist but these two dimensions, three dimensions, because of the boundary, uh, it's quite tricky to have this rigorous proof as far as we understand. And that's the motivation we actually attack this problem in the experiment. And why do we care about these higher dimensional uh, non-emission quantum systems? Well, recently people in our community or finance matter point out this non-emission system can be mapped to the other context uh, in, in physics, such as the curved space can be effectively understood as the non-emission system. So you can study the curved dynamics or quantum system in the curved space by just introducing non-emitticity into the system. Another example is the high order topological insulator, or you can also test the quantum information, uh, the rules or LER in the non-emission setting. And there is a very clear application, such as the single mode lasing uh, by coupling uh, several the laser source uh, in the expansion region. Okay, so how do we see these effects in the in our optical lattice system? So essentially, uh, because we have a lattice, we need to first confirm that the exceptional points emerge in the lattice system, and 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 measure this uh, band structure as we did in the ball. So here we have a very small dissipation and large dissipation. Uh, but and in the community, it has been very well known that if we form the exceptional points in the lattice, we expect to see that when you increase the dissipation, so this exceptional point actually move in the momentum space, and whenever it just grows, there is a like zero gap left over behind this exceptional points forming the Fermi arc, and and this Fermi arc is essentially in our system. I mean, lies in the bulk, not in the surface, which is slightly different from this uh, other solid state systems. And that's exactly what can we can measure in, in our uh, system. So this is the, uh, the, the numerical calculation of this band structure, band gap we expect to see. So for the small gap, we have exceptional point here or there, or here or there. But if you increase the dissipation, this uh, exceptional point move from position one to two, and inform this uh, the, the Fermi arc. That's exactly what we can see in this numerical calculation. So this is the exceptional point, and as a function of the dissipation, and you measure this real part of the band gap or uh, damping rates. That's exactly what we did in the bulk system. So we can do the same thing uh, in the real experiments, although it's a little bit noisy. You can see the band gap closing here or there. And this actually identify how this uh, exceptional points move when you increase the dissipation. So it actually, it actually confirmed that our system, uh, we verify this system works as we wish. So our effective Hamiltonian uh, describe our system pretty well. So with that in mind, we can be ready to uh, see this uh, skin effect. But I think actually, if you look at the skin effects, uh, we have to be a little bit careful because in the non-emission system, we have a topology both in the momentum space and the complex energy planes. So in the Hermitian uh, lattice, we know the band topology by looking at the uh, block wave functions. But in the non-emission system, because your energy eigenvalue becomes the complex, even in 1D, you have a two-dimensional, for instance, the uh, complex energy planes, and by looking the topology behind this complex energy, you can define 
uh, zero over one non-zero winding number, and you can tell what kind of topology lies behind this uh, spectrum. So at least in the one dimensions, it was rigorously proved that the skin effects exist only and uh, only when this spectral the spectral area is non-zero or the winding number in this complex energy plane is non-zero. So if you look at this complex eigen energy plane, you can tell whether there is a skin effect or not. So that's true in the 1D. So however, our experiment actually has the trap in this case. So in the real space, uh, we can do both this the spectral measurement and the real space measurement. And this is the scheme we do. So without any skin effects, our atoms just bounce back and forth. So that we expect they just go back and forth, which is uh, very simple uh, dipole oscillations. But when you turn on the skin effects, we believe or we expect some atoms just bounce from the left wall, but there might be some sticky uh, wall, which actually trumps some atoms at the wall. And that is, this is what we would like to see in the real experiments. And if you have the corresponding picture in the momentum space, and if you plot this uh, real versus uh, imaginary energy, we measure ligand energy. We believe this, uh, when there's no skin effects, this spectrum has to be somewhat degenerate because this uh, left and right nodes is symmetric. Um, but whenever you turn on the skin effects, it should break down this degenerates, which means there must be some loop in this uh, spectrum energy, like, uh, spectrum of the ideal energy. That's exactly what people have to prove in the one dimensional case. So in our experiment, we actually do both measurements and prove the existence of, two, existence of the skin effects in our two-dimensional system. So in the first experiments, uh, we actually uh, measure uh, the imaginary and real part of the ideal energy by analyzing our two-dimensional measurements of the band gap, as we did before, when we identify the sectional points. So when you turn off the loss or the skin effects, if you measure this eigen spectrum, it's essentially uh, arc or just line. And I have to mention that this line is actually degenerate, which means the system just go back and forth, except a few points uh, because of the noise in our system. When you turn off on the loss or skin effects, this eigen spectrum immediately change, occupying the uh, finite area in the spectrum. Or if you choose uh, one particular line in the uh, momentum space, we immediately see the loop, which tells that there is a band topology behind this complex entity. So this is kind of proof that we expect to see the skin effects, uh, although this is indirect evidence based on this spectral measurement. So, okay, on with the loads, you have a uh, complex eigenvalues, right? In the top, top left one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, of course. Uh, but this is only a few percent of the, the, the points we measure. So it's, 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 it's more like the Sean noise we measure. Mm -hmm. So this is not, so if you plot this line, it, it's not a continuous line, it's just one shot. It's essentially the least. Thank you. So, the area of the surrounding, so does it have any counterpart in the skin effect? Like, uh, how, how much skin effect do you have? Some... That's actually a great question. Uh, we have no uh, particular understanding in that. Mm -hmm. All I can say here is, uh, yes, the discretized winding number tells the existence of the things, but the mm. actual area, uh, yeah, we don't know. Right? So let's go to the more direct evidence, which is the, uh, the advantage of our experiments. So to see this, the real space uh, data, we essentially prepare the atoms in the harmonic potential because our experiments run on top of this harmonic trap. So we first prepare the system and just induce some dipole oscillation, which is the left-right oscillations. And at some point, we choose whether we switch on or off the skin effects. Without the skin effects, we believe the atom go to the right and come back from the turning point. And it's a classical oscillation, left and right. 
But when you turn on the skin effects, we believe because there is a skin loss, which is the white ionic state of the system, some atom will be left over, maybe stop. So by doing this, we can actually probably visualize the, the real space imaging of this skin effect. But of course, to see these effects, we need a really, really good uh, resolution in the special domain. So without any special technique, it's really hard to see, but we actually implement a so-called quantum gas magnifier, which has been developed in our community in Hamburg. And doing so, our resolution is really great, around maybe 100 nanometer or even better. So you can probably resolve some dynamics. And this is how we measure. So in the left-hand side, uh, we have a, a wave function of the atoms or density distribution atoms with the skin effects. And you see that when you, uh, as a function of time, the wave packet goes to the right and just stay on the right because of the sticky mode on, the, on your right hand side. But without the skin effects, as we wish, uh, the atom go to the right and come back to the left. This is the half period of the harmonic potential. So if you wait more, it actually go to the left. And if you carefully quantify where the center of mass is as a function of time, uh, in the top left, we actually have a center of mass position in micrometer as a function of the whole time. So without the skin effects, the light blue, it just go to the up and down. This is a part of the dipole oscillation. With the skin effects on, it just goes up and stick there because there is an item mode uh, the atom should stay, which is quite well set, uh, consistent with the, uh, the numerical estimations. So this is the direct evidence of these uh, skin effects in 2D uh, in quantum systems. And there are a few things I want to uh, point out. So yes, it's great to observe the skin effects in a normal emission system because this is the iconic uh, effects we, we are supposed to see. But besides, we actually uh, realize this so-called complex vector potential to the atoms. In some sense, skin effects is just because of the complex vector potential or uh, the non-reciprocal coupling or tunneling in the optical. In our case, we do not have a non-reciprocal tunneling at the beginning. But if you write down the effective Hamiltonian, which looks a little bit complicated, which is fine, but it's just, just math. And at the end, it turns out that we have the uh, odd parity uh, coupling terms in the momentum space. So essentially, you can understand either two ways. You, we have a complex vector potential, which is great. Uh, uh, we can play with the complex and real vector potential in our synthetic quantum system, or uh, we have this uh, odd parity or non-reciprocal tunneling uh, in the momentum space, which is why our system shows this non-emergency or non-emission skin effects. Another point I want to point out is we can actually extend this non-emission system with different tools. And one example is you can do some flow cat engineering. And we do the exactly same experiment, but we actually drive one of the parameter in our system in such a way that these flow cap bands in the energy plane go uh, up and down and couple and open the uh, additional uh, band gap. And you can also measure this band gap closing or exceptional points. But one thing I want to emphasize is usually we control the dissipation in the horizontal plane, but we have another knob using the flow cap. So this is uh, one uh, thing we do. And of course, we have a big question whether the skin effects exist in this flow cat uh, regimes. Another thing we are doing, uh, at least theoretically at this point, is you can realize the high order exceptional points, like a third order, which could be uh, quite sensitive, which is a little bit arguable at this point in the community. And we can also study other uh, phenomena. So this is all I have about this non emission system. I have uh, only three more slides uh, that I highlight another type of experiments. So I will switch the gear to spend three more minutes. So uh, the previous experiment, we worked with interbium experiments, but here we actually work with erbium uh, atoms in the two-dimensional setting, which is bosons and dipole atoms. But probably some of you know that these uh, atoms in 2D 
is an exciting uh, platform because we have these two dimensional superfluids with two dimensions. So they're exciting works in our community over the past two decades almost. Um, however, there's a one question because what if we introduce the dipolar interactions with 2D? Well, in, at least in our experiments, in the recent experiment, we confirmed that the superfluids still exist in, in the context of the BKT transitions. So we measure all these kind of things uh, and so on and so forth. So that's great. So we are now have this, we are now having this dipolar BKT superfluids uh, with all these tunability, which is great. And, and this is almost the first tunable dipolar BKT superfluids uh, other than uh, accident polarity system. But in the solid states, this dipole angle is not tunable because of their intrinsic uh, properties. But now we can tune everything. But the big question I'd like to just introduce today is, what if you have a very strong dipole interactions? Probably you, some of you know that in the two dimensions, we know this kind of scale invariance property when you have the short range interaction, like delta tau interactions. And we know that because of this uh, scale invariance, if you measure these breathing modes, which is just the oscillation frequency when the wave function just breathe, we know that it should around be two. That's a very strict mathematical result, unless this uh, contact interaction is very strong, breaking the, uh, the scaling variance. So it has been measured in a different context, but very recently, uh, when you have a very, very strongly interacting fermions, for instance, this so-called quantum anomaly has been measured in both theoretically and so their signal is very simple. They measure the oscillation frequency when for this breathing mode. It turns out that it can go beyond the value of two. In the 2D, no matter what you do, it's usually two or below two. The only way it can go beyond the two is a quantum anomaly. So this one is very well uh, established. But the question we have is, what if you introduce a dipole dipolar? And the reason why people observe this quantum anomaly is because you when you have a very strong interactions, there is a new length scale emerging in the 2D. Uh, unless you do, I mean, 2D, this 2D system with the delta type quantum interactions, there is no length scale, which is why we have a dynamical scale invariance. But our question is, what if, what if I introduce the strong dipolar interactions then probably this dipolar length scale will probably compete with the 2D system. Probably we expect to see something. So we do very preliminary, preliminary experiments. Uh, I cannot say this is the final results. We are still working on. And when you tilt the dipolar angle from some angle to the 90 degrees, we actually start to see that this breathing oscillator frequency go beyond the two. And probably you realize the error by is so large. Uh, we actually work in this regime, but we consistently observe something beyond the two. And we are we are very curious if this is somewhat related to the quantum anomaly, uh, which should be, but we are still working on. So if you happen to have any good suggestions, uh, yeah, please uh, let us know. So I came to the last slide and uh, thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions. If Okay, questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm curious about the uh, uh, complex gauge, gauge field you mentioned briefly. Like, uh, yeah, is it the uh, help? Um, so, uh, but usually the um, how how say that? Uh, the setup is the same as the exactly. What, what you explained previously. So I I'm I, sorry I don't get the points right. Is it I think on the momentum lattice or something? Uh no, no. we have a just real space lattice. Uh huh. And we create uh just real valued complex uh, real valued uh vector potential. Uh huh. For example, spin of a coupling. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when you turn on the dissipation, uh -huh. we do have both real com uh real a the vector potential. And the complex A as well. Oh, I see. But uh, for that purpose, I expect that the 
uh, sort of the how say the spatial related to the two sides or something like that. But uh, oh, uh, two body loss. May no, no, no. I mean the sing corrective single but corrective single pass loss or the. Um, no. And here, all I'm doing is uh, we just on broke a single pass loss. You're taking it. so yes. it has, I see, I see. But uh, let's see. It. And this is how we actually map this system to the curve space because this complex uh vector potential. Can be real, I mean, can go back to the real if you just change the uh, the coordinate plane. Mm -hmm. So, okay, yeah, pre discontinuated, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, so thank you so much for the very stimulating talk. So, one of the uh, unique properties of the two dimensional skin effect is the uh, dependence of the geometry of lattices. So can we change or control the geometry of lattices in your experimental setup? Uh, currently, uh, that's a very good question. Currently, probably no. We have a kind of circular track because we use the uh, harmonic potential. So in the next generation experiment, mm -hmm. probably we can either use the uh, DMD or SLM, uh, some, some adaptive optics to make a very well-defined boundary. Another approach is probably we can use the tweezer way. Uh, with the very well defined uh, open body conditions. Yeah, but that's all. Another uh, possible kind of approach to realize such a geometry dependent skin effect, for example, to introduce a defect in your system. So, is it possible to introduce a defect or discrimination or something like that? Uh, yeah, it's very, yes. So, yeah, even our lab or other labs, uh, we are controlling and designing the potential as we wish. So, the, de the defect can be introduced on demand. In principle, yes. Oh, thank you. And then uh, I have another question. So in one of the slides, you mentioned the uh, higher order skin effect. So can we, can you uh, kind of uh, experimentally realize higher order skin effect in the Uh <laughs> That's also related to your first question. So to look at it, uh, we need a kind of corner uh, boundary conditions. <clears throat> so in principle, uh, it's possible, but practically it might be challenging. So the very, promising ways to use, hopefully, for example, tweezer rays or something very local or localized the optical trap. And uh, hopefully uh, we believe it will be within our reach within a couple of years. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone who says so. In this grammar term, actually, this is for responsible for normal vision. So, uh, this is generally coming from the imaginary part of the dissipation of this function kind of uh, the ambition. But I am talking about this EX and UX, I mean, this vector potential. So, what is the physical origin of this term? So, you mean this, this one? This first term, EX and UX, which is momentum shift. Uh, yeah, this term, yes. Uh, yeah, the physical reason uh, is essentially uh, one way is uh, whenever you introduce the dissipation, uh, because your these two bands, the skin will be coupled bands, without the even dissipation, there's a dispersive uh, coupling, which is why you open the band again. But whenever you turn on the, uh, the dissipation, actually remove the particle in a spin sensitive way. Which means this band structure will be deformed. Spin up and spin down see the slightly different laws, which means the band structure has to be deformed. So that's a, that's the reason why the complex a, complex A emerged. That's one way. Another way is if you don't like this complex vector potential, you imagine that my space is curved. Then spin up and spin down live in a different like a different curved space. Then you can actually recover all these vector potential back to the real world. So I don't wait. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned toward the end uh, the breakdown of staining in the city. Is there a theoretical prediction to compare this or it's not known? Uh, at least in the harmonic potential or just 2D with the cold atoms without the dipole interactions. Actually, the Maxim Lushani in UMass Amherst and his colleagues, they actually calculate, estimate uh, this range. So they already predict like 1% effects and I people see. observe. 
With the dipole interactions, as far as we know, there is no literature. Oh, I see. Uh, and oh. we have no theoretical understanding. Only thing I know is with this, there is a new length scale. There should be. And we expect to see something, but I don't know how big, how large. It should be. Oh, I see. So it's, a pure, it's not even clear if there is really an anomaly or not. Uh, it's, it's purely theoretical. Or is there a guarantee? Well, of course, you're, you're making the purely theoretical. Well, I mean, physically, I expect to see the quantum mm -hmm. anomaly whenever there is a new length scale. Yeah, the yeah. mechanism is different because of these uh, strong interactions or dipole like, interactions. Uh, I, I think physically it should be, mm -hmm. but the details structure we don't need. I see. Thank you. Um, you yeah. I have a related question. So, is it possible to control this uh, contact interaction in the dipole dipole interaction individually? Can it really switch off the contact interaction? Uh, unfortunately, in our sample, we can control somewhat, but we cannot completely turn off the uh, S wave sketching lens. Mm -hmm. So, in these measurements, we are in the situation where this dipole interaction is even a little bit larger than this contact interaction, okay. which is why we call this a very strongly dipole. But I cannot completely turn it off. Okay, that, that, that's a one limitation. Thank you. But information, this is a very clear memory, so don't take it serious. All of we are confused. Uh, so then questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, speaker for a great time.